Welcome to another edition of Camera Photo Talk podcast. Today's guest has been a documentary photographer, fashion photographer for over 60 years. She's been an actress, a singer. She's led an extraordinary life, American born, now residing in England. It's an honor and somebody I've been wanting to talk to about their connection, their life and their journey through photography for a, a long time. I'd like to welcome Marilyn Stafford. Hi, Marilyn. Hello, Zach. Nice to hear you. Well, we've been fighting tech issues for the last couple of weeks. We got it together today. Zach, tech issues have been the bane of my life. Oh, mine too. I'm the only photographer who probably knows nothing about technology. Do you know, I'm not a geek. I'm not into sort of the technology myself. As long as I've got a lens and a camera, that's it. Absolutely. Actually, I stopped taking pictures when everything went digital because it meant learning a whole new technology and I wasn't up to it. So I just put away, I put away the cameras and that's it. So don't talk to me at all about digital. <laughs> I don't know anything about it. <laughs> Did you used to like getting in a dark room and printing your own prints and developing your own legs? No, I didn't. I um, actually took a leaf out of the book of Cartier-Bresson because I knew Cartier in Paris and he was a sort of mentor, and he never printed his own things either. In Paris at the time, in Montparnasse, there was a dark room owned by a man called Pierre Gassman. Cartier would go up there with his negs and go into the dark room with him, and he let me go in with him a few times. Gassman would print up the prints, and outside, his wife would retouch everything. You know, the, the spots that get on yeah. print. I never really liked doing darkroom work. I, I don't mind standing there with a technician and saying what I want. Uh, having said that, in my early days in photography, I did work for photographers and did have to do the darkroom work, oh. like mixing up the chemicals drying the prints and the negs and things like that. So I know what it's about. You've met some extraordinary people in your life, haven't you? And just looking at your life story, and you mentioned Cartier and being mentored and photographed some incredible people. And that's something I want to find out about, a little bit about the people you've met as well. What are you up to now? Um, I am basking in the glory of a most beautiful and successful exhibition of over a hundred photographs at Brighton Museum. It has been my first really big museum exhibition. It was curated by Nina Emmett of Photo Document. It is so beautiful, I have to say so myself. A book of my photographs has been published by Blue Coat Press, and that book is sort of the basis of the exhibition. The book is called Marilyn Stafford, A Life in Photography. And the exhibition at Brighton Museum now is just that. And it's quite stunning, quite stunning. What was the feeling like when you looked at it and you could see your life journey on the wall? I, I'm sort of detached in a way. I lived through it all. I'm in a different life now. And so I just look at it rather objectively. Mm. It, is it going to tour the exhibition? Yes. Um, it is going next to Dimbola House on the Isle of Wight. And Dimbola House is the home at the time of one of England's most wonderful photographers, a Victorian lady called Julia Margaret Cameron, right. who used to take pictures with a very, very large box uh, camera, plate camera, and she mixed her own chemicals for her glass plates. So I feel rather honored to be moving to this venerable location. Are you going over to the Isle of Wight to see it? I'm not going over, no. I'm not really up to too much traveling these days. 
You have a photo award in your name, don't you? Do you want to talk a little bit about the award for women photographers? About five years ago, uh, through the good offices of Nina Emmett's uh, organization, Photo Document, I set up an award for women photographers who were working on or had worked on picture stories, documentary stories of situations that needed to be brought to public attention or had been brought to public attention and what was being done about them, either to make a situation better or to continue to make it better. Anyway, the women who are working on the, on the stories are very intrepid young women who are doing beautiful photography. Yeah. And the first story was from a young woman who was English living in Delhi, and she had been going over to Kashmir working on a story about the effects of this war situation on people and the post-traumatic distress disorder. I was delighted to learn from her that the award money permitted her to pay for a driver, which got her into areas she might not have been able to get into without him, but he also helped protect her. So it was very, uh, it was wonderful that, that we could help her. And she's now gone on to greater things and is working for very big international newspapers good photographer. So the award runs every year. When is it open for submissions? Um, we, we open it on International Women's Day and uh, we will be having the awards announced soon. I'm not quite sure which date, but very soon. I would definitely put some links for that in the information box, which would accompany this podcast. Tell well, information on the award can be obtained through Photo Document, which is spelled F-O-T-O, document.org slash award. And via your website too. And via my website. I'm getting a new website ready. I don't know when it's going to be up and running, but it will be soon. Well, that sounds good. You've had three books published, am I right? Yes, a very small book called Silent Stories, but prior to that was a book on Lebanon, which has a rather interesting history. I was in Lebanon in the 60s and was invited by a publisher there to do a book on the country. It had just come out of the 1958 war, and peace was there, and there was hope that there would be tourism. And so this publisher asked me to do a book, and I went all around the country taking photographs. And of course, when, and I say of course, because it's inevitable that what I want and what the publisher want are two different things. I really wanted to show the country, yeah. which has good things and bad things, like every place. He didn't like that book because he wanted a book not on children swinging on their swings at Ramadan or people in the mountains preparing food by hand on the roof of a house. He wanted photographs of Paris shops and how terribly westernized and very beautifully Parisian Beirut was. So we parted company. And in the scheme of things, it took 30 years for the book to get published. So overnight overnight success, you can say I am not. (laughs) Was that Silent Stories? Yes, Silent Stories, a journey through Lebanon in the 60s. I'd love to look through that book, as I would love to look through stories and pictures as well, which were... 2014 by Shoreham, Wordfest Publications, and Silent Stories was by Saki Books in 98. Now, that book was a, a small book, which was just a small little outline of 
my career, if you will, yeah. and some stories. And uh, it, it's, I believe, I have some copies, but it is now out of print. Mm, it is. I've looked. <laughs> I've been looking for it. Um, well, if you send me your address, I'll send you copies. Oh, wow, yes, yeah, thank you. That would be wonderful. How would you sort of categorise yourself as a photographer, as a sort of general scheme of your life as a photographer, fashion photographer, editorial photographer, documentary photographer? Where do you see yourself? I see myself as a documentary photographer, and even the fashion was sort of documentary too. It was, yeah. Well, everything has a reason, you know. The reason I took the models out into the streets of Paris was because I didn't have a studio. And so rather than paying for a, a hired studio where I would fall about getting my feet twisted in all of the cables <laughs> and trying to figure out which is the best lighting, it was easier for me just to take the models out into the streets and to photograph them in streets I was learning to discover. So it was a double game. Yeah. I was learning about the streets of Paris at the same time as I was photographing the models there. It was very simple. Was nobody really doing that then? No, because it the photographs that I took in Paris were of the early ready-to-wear. Yeah. And post-war uh, France had a, a revival of clothing for young working women um, through this new ready-to-wear. Prior to that, if you were a woman um, who liked pretty clothes, you couldn't go into a shop and buy them. You had to go to haute couture, which was very, very expensive, very beautiful, made to measure. Mm. But only very uh, rich women were able to, to afford that. And uh, uh, this whole new group of young professional manufacturers Gave, was born following uh, the war. And so the office I was working for, the PR office I was working for, had a contract to do distribution of photographs using various fabrics mm. that she was getting paid to publicize. So they were clothes from ready to wear as well as haute couture. And so I was able to photograph beautiful Givenchy, Dior, as, as well as uh, haute couture clothes, as well as the young new designers of ready-to-wear. I took them out into the streets because that's where young women who were working would be moving around. I did, of course, do a few in nice, elegant locations because they were more adapted to that kind of clothing. One of my favorites is beautiful Givenchy dress, which is haute couture, and it was photographed in the Tour d'Argent, which is a restaurant in Paris overlooking Notre Dame. You must have been the only woman at the time photographing fashion. I'm not sure. I really didn't think about it. There's nobody in my mind who comes to mind in that period. It's very possible. Very possible. You know the prints in your book? Who printed them? What do you mean? The prints for your exhibition, which I presume were reproduced for the book. Oh, yes. Who printed them? The prints that I sell mostly are silver gelatin prints. Mm. And they're made from the negatives in a dark room. And they're made by the master printer Robin Bell. I thought so, yeah. Who is near Hastings, and they are photographs that prints that are so beautiful, you, are. you could 
literally plunge into them. They have that feeling of dimension. But I also, I'm also now printing very beautiful digital prints, and those are on special Hanumale paper, and those are being printed by Spectrum in Brighton. Yeah. And they are being sold um, at the exhibition at the Brighton Museum, but also both prints will be available to purchase on my website, uh, both the collector prints, which are hand-printed from negative. For the reproduction of your book, did you scan these pictures? Because they're really beautiful. Their quality and the tonal ranges. Yes, everything everything was scanned. Medium format, most of it, isn't it? Square. The book, the book is really, the book is really terrific. I'm most pleased by it. The quality is fantastic. Were you using a Rolly Flex at the time? I started using a Rolly Flex when I started working, because it was the only camera I had, and then eventually I moved on to 35 millimeter, and of course the Rolly Flex has the advantage of the larger neg, but mm. the 35 mil has the advantage of being able to change your lenses and to take a photograph from further afield with a longer lens so you don't have to be right on the, on the scene. What film are you using? Zach, I'm terribly sorry to say I'm a very lazy photographer. <laughs> I'm, I like to make life very easy for myself. And most of the time... I probably used Tri-X because film. it gave me the advantage of shooting in light situations which weren't perfect. So I didn't really mind if, if, if it was grainy or not. And, of course, when I, when I was working um, in the early period of fashion, the photographs were distributed free to local French newspapers and magazines because the office that was being paid to promote the fabrics sent them around. So they got distributed all over. And what was terribly funny was there's a photograph of little kids sitting on a curbstone in Montmartre laughing their heads off mm. and the model quite oblivious to their presence, showing a coat and saying up on top, it says Montmartre. It, it raised the eyebrows of a French columnist who said that um, this was snobism taking the clothes out into the streets. So I was called a snob. It was a really interesting shot of a model outside. I think it looks like a florist in Paris. Just behind her to the right is this guy looking at her. Yes. <laughs> in, a, in a rain mac. Yes. Yes. And the, the juxtaposition of that shot is, is fantastic. Well, that, that photograph is the uh, photograph that is on the poster advertising the Brighton Museum exhibition, yeah. which I'm very pleased to say is very beautiful. And um, she was, you know, just doing her job. I was doing mine, and, and he stopped and had a quick look. <laughs> he's, he's, he's rooted to the spot, isn't he? Well, just what you're talking about, it must have been a very new thing for people to see this and woman photographer on the streets of Paris with a model. It's everyday life now. It is everyday life now. I suppose at the time it was rare. I didn't think about it. I just did it. Just going back to when we were talking about who printed your silver gelatin prints, I've known Robert Bell for a long time and he's such a wonderful printer. He's a good man too. Oh, yes. Take me back, Marilyn. Take me back to where it all started let's just go through your journey a little bit and talk about some of the people you met the experiences you had you were working mother as well you've been to a few places and you just met some amazing people i want to find out a little bit about them let's go back you were born in cleveland ohio in 1925 yes going to be a singer is that right or an actress no, I, I was going to be the great American actress. And uh, I had early training in the theater, 
because at the time uh, there was a movement to separate Broadway, which was the great seat of theater in the United States, from um, the provinces and to help local theaters uh, become much more professional. And in Cleveland, a group of people started the Cleveland Playhouse. And that today is one of leading American theaters. At the time, they set up this lovely building, which had two theaters in it, a very large one and a smaller one, more intimate. And having been successful for a few years, they decided they would make a children's theater and train children, possibly to become apprentices for the adults later. Each school locally was invited to send a child, and I was selected by my school. We met in this theater, little theater, and everybody was invited one at a time to get up on the stage and say a line. The line was, bring that man to me. If you go through your mind, how many different ways you can say that line, that's what went on. All the kids, one by one, got up and said that line. I didn't know it at the time, but um, among the children there were some people who became quite famous later on, both as actors and as directors or producers, uh, both on Broadway and on uh, uh, in, in Hollywood. When was that, about 1946? Well, I was sort of about 10. Oh, yeah. So it must have been about then, yes. I was, I was very, I'm very amazed and amused to see on television a screening of a film called The Secret Garden. Yeah. It was one of the first leading roles I had playing the little girl in that, on stage. So you played it on the stage? I played it on the stage because it was at the Cleveland yeah, Playhouse Yeah, and then it was Theater. adapted into a movie. But I, I, see, I see that currently it is playing on the wow. television as a film. And when did you first become aware of, of photography? I was always with a little camera in my hand because families at the time had brown brownie cameras, if you remember those. Yeah. And they were, they were kind of a box camera and they had a little sliding doodah on the side, which was the shutter. I have one of them, actually. I've got one. I, I still own one. It was my grandfather's. Oh, how fabulous. Have you used it? I haven't never used it. Was it in a little brown case? Very, it's just sort of an ugly looking case with with this sliver on the yeah. lower right hand side. And yeah, um, that's right. I think it used a sort of size 120 film. I remember going on a picnic with my family and we were sitting by a stream of water and I suddenly became very moved by this absolutely clear, clear crystal water going over pebbles in the stream. And I was so moved that I wanted to take a photograph of it, which I did. I went into the water, took my shoes off, got into the stream and took a photograph. And when I got the photograph back, it was just pebbles with water going over that it didn't have the emotion and I didn't quite understand that. And it really put me off taking photographs. And so I didn't really think in terms of taking photographs until much, much, much later when I was in New York trying to get work as a theater actress. And I had friends who I had met who were filmmakers doing documentary films, which I'd never heard of. And they would take me to the Museum of Modern Art, where there's a marvelous collection of early documentary films, which are very precious. And we would go there and, and watch all of these films. So I sort of was drinking in this documentary thing through film, 
then one day they wanted to do a little documentary on Albert Einstein. Now, this was in about 1948. And of course, it was the end of World War II. And there had been the use of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima. They wanted to make a film of him uh, speaking about this use of atomic energy in this way and to ask him to speak out against the use of atomic warfare. And they invited me to come along with them and to Princeton. And in the back seat of the car, I was given my first 35 mil camera, which I'd never used before, and taught, taught how to use it, told I would be taking the stills, which is exactly what I did. And we went to Einstein's house in Princeton, which is still there. And you can look it up on the internet, I think. You can still see it. And of course, I wasn't thinking as photographer at all. Uh, so I didn't think, well, this is Einstein's house. I should maybe take a photograph of the house. I should take a photograph of him opening the door. You know, things like that I didn't think about. I was terrified. I was just going to have to stand there and take a photograph with a camera I didn't know about. Anyway, he did come to the door and let us in and took us to his lounge where the director sat him down and was talking to him while the producer was setting up the lights. And I was told to stand in a certain place and just focus and click. That's just what I did. But I did overhear them talking, and uh, they were shooting in 16 millimeter film. And Einstein asked the director, can you tell me, please, um, how many feet per second per second go through the camera? And the director explained all of this, which I couldn't, of course, ever explain to you. And at the end of it, Einstein just simply said, ah, oh, yes, now I understand. Thank you very much, which I thought was rather nice. So you went to your first ever professional job. Yes. With a 35 mil SLR, which you'd never used before. Never used. And you went to photograph Einstein. Yes. That's phenomenal. So it's it's known as starting at the top. How do you reflect back on that photographing Einstein? He's such an iconic individual in history, isn't he, now? In in retrospect, I I regret that I didn't take more photographs. But there I was with a camera I didn't even know how to use. Really didn't understand what taking uh, documentary photographs were. So I just did what I was told. And it was years later that I kicked myself for not doing more pictures of him, of course. That was some first job, I have to say. That sort of beats them all, really. The fact that you didn't really know how to use the camera. What was he like as a person, Albert Einstein? You know, I didn't really know him. I just saw him very briefly. Yeah. And um, I, cannot, I cannot tell you what he was like as a person. He was very polite. He was very welcoming and very down to earth. Mm. He was a person. He wasn't what you would expect a genius to be, I suppose. Although, what is a genius expected to be? It's interesting the, being a photographer, isn't it? You meet all of these people and through who are sort of iconic figures to a lot of people or heartthrobs or heroes or in, influ, inspirationalists. Now I'll say that again. As a photographer, you do meet, you, sorry, as a photographer, you do jump into people's lives. Yes. You do get these opportunities to meet iconic people, people who are written in the history books. And that's the beauty of our job as photographers. And it is later on you do think, wow, I met him, on wow, I met her. And even for myself in my years as a photographer, the people I've met at the time, you just do your job and you, you leave. But it's later on you think, that person's touched so many people's lives and I've just spent 20 minutes with them. Yes, yes, it's, I agree it's with It's amazing. You. 
Yes. You became a, an assistant photographer. Yes. It was your first assisting work with Francesca Scavulo. Yes, Scavulo was just beginning as a fashion photographer. He had a studio and I was hired to be an assistant. And of course, for a fashion photographer, uh, that meant what was called picking up pins. Because, you know, when at the time, the the clothing was very restricted in the sense that dresses were tight, they were form-fitting. And of course, if you took a photograph of a model wearing that in the studio, you pinned it up in the back to show the curves of the model in the front. And of course, when the shoot was over, the poor girl would blow out its big sigh of relief and all the pins would go over the floor. And my job was to pick up the pins. And I also mixed up some of the chemicals and dried prints and hung up the negs to dry and things like that. So I did my stay in the dark room. At the time, uh, he really wanted to be a fashion photographer, and I was leaning really toward the documentary. And we would have long discussions about it, and he was talking of beautiful women, and I was talking about things in the street. And um, it, it was kind of interesting. Scavallo was really famous for photographing Bert Reynolds' nude, wasn't he? Or something with Brooke Shields. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. All I know is that he became a very, very famous fashion photographer and was always on the covers of Vogue and big magazines like yeah, that. Yeah, he photographed Janis Joplin as well, didn't he? That was quite a, a well-known picture of his. I don't know, because when I left New York, I never was in contact with him. Where did you go from New York? Did you go to Paris? Yes. And I, I went to Paris through the fact that the fact of male infidelity. My best friend's husband, she learned, was having an affair. And she went to him and said, what are you going to do about it? And he, of course, said, I don't know, go home to your mother while I sort myself out, you know, that sort of thing. And she said, no way. You sort yourself out. I'm going to Paris. I'm taking Marilyn with me, and you can pay for it all. And that's exactly how I got to Paris, through male infidelity. And the two of us went, and of course, I fell in love with Paris and stayed on. She came back. They divorced. She remarried. He remarried, you know, the usual. <laughs> but not the woman he was having an affair with. Right. You became friends with Robert Kappa in Paris. Yes. What was Robert Kappa like? Well, I adored him. He was about 20 years older than me and sort of, I think, considered me little sister. He was very warm and generous and friendly. He, he was really very nice. I had been singing for about a year, and my I was losing my voice. When I told Kappa that I didn't know what to do next, he thought it would be good for me to become the assistant of David Seymour, called Shim, who, along with him and Cartier-Bresson, founded Magnum Photographs. I decided that was not my way, because I did not want to get blown up in a war zone, and, of course, both Kappa and Shim did. So were they asking you to go out and be their assistants on assignments? Well, he, he, he said he would introduce me to Shim, who was looking for an assistant. That was his way of helping me. And I said, no, I didn't want that. Didn't want to be an assistant to a war zone photographer. Was your own work and your own photography and your own vision in the back of your head when you were in Paris? No, I kind of I kind of have a one track mind. And when I'm singing, I'm singing. And that was all that interested me at the time. And when I stopped singing, uh didn't know what to do and fell into the photography quite by accident because I had taken photographs mm. and a friend introduced me to a friend who introduced me to another friend who offered me some work taking these photographs of the early ready-to-wear. And that's how I really got started. It wasn't really planned. Nothing was ever planned. 
I'm wondering what the next step is going to be. So over the years, you became friends with Henry Cartier Bresson, and he became your sort of mentor, am I right? Yes, indeed. He was really very lovely. He was married at the time to a Indonesian dancer called Ratna Mohini. They would invite me to dinner at their house. Often Cartier was invited out on various dinners to welcome people from different countries. And one evening I was invited to join them um, and Ratna dressed me up in a beautiful sari and I looked very glamorous. One of the guests at dinner invited me out the following evening and of course I went looking like me rather than like the beautiful glamorous dressed up lady in a sari. (laughs) <laughs> and that ended that friendship. So, <laughs> it shows you something, I suppose. <laughs> what did Cartier teach you? Cartier was not a teacher. Cartier never said, do this, do that. Mm. Cartier would say, if you do this, the likelihood of this effect happens. If you do that, something else happens. He was always very broad. He never dictated. I was always amazed at the way he worked because I would go out in the street with him quite often. And, of course, I was very tiny, had this big Roliflex camera. And he was very tall, wore a hat usually, and a raincoat, and so you couldn't see his Leica pressed up to his face. Plus the fact that this was post-war France, and you didn't see many women wandering around the streets of France uh, or of Paris with, with a uh, big camera like, like the uh, Roliflex. In fact, you didn't see women wandering around the streets with cameras at all. And so I, I would you know, be able to go out with him and and see the way he worked. And he worked very quietly. Often you wouldn't even know he was taking a photograph. Sometimes he would, if we were seated in a cafe, for instance, I remember one day um, he saw a photograph. He didn't even lift the camera up to his eyes. He just lifted it up, took the photograph and went on talking. You were having a great apprenticeship then, weren't you? You were out Kappa. I suppose I suppose you could call it an apprenticeship. Scarello, yes. Yes. you were Cartier Bresson. Uh, you know, it was it was an interesting period for you. It was. It was. Let's call it photography education. Started coming out in the fifties, didn't it? You were an assistant to the late Jean Fenn as well in Paris. Yes. Yes. Well, Jean Finn was an American fashion photographer. He had come over to Paris and had a very large studio up on the fifth floor walk up um, just off of the Place de la Concorde. And he had a big contract photographing what were called um, bread mink. They, they were not natural mink. And... Um, It was a very big fashion contract for an American company. And so I would very often be involved in those shoots. And I remember one day, Zach, that he wanted some dressing for for the photograph. And he sent me around the corner to Cartier Jewelry to pick up some jewels for for the uh, mink coats. There I was, walking with thousands of pounds worth of diamonds necklaces in a little brown package as though I were carrying a ham sandwich. It was it was very weird. That was the period when you moved over to become the photographer, the fashion photographer. Yes. I can't remember how it happened, but um, I, I made friends with a French photographer who in, in England, by the time I moved to England later, and he was looking for some outlet to earn a living. He was married with a child, and he was photographing fashion shows. We decided we would set up a little agency together, which would cover fashion shows for magazines, newspapers, 
who wanted pictures mm. um, but couldn't afford to send a photographer over to cover this. And so we set up a little agency, went over to Paris, Rome, London, New York, to photograph the seasonal shows of haute couture and ready to wear. And I did that for about 20 years. And that gave me the money to subsidize the kind of photographs that I wanted to take, which wouldn't bring in money, if you know what I mean. Uh, so I went to India to photograph Indira Gandhi, which I paid for. Yeah. But it was only because I had this money that I was able to live on from the fashion. And that's how it works, isn't it? You work as a working photographer and you can fund the things you want to do. Sure. And that's the story of most documentary photographers. You've got to make a living. Yes. And I, sitting in, in the, the defilés of fashion shows, there were a lot of photographers who did exactly the same. They, they, they did the fashion, which paid for it, but they would go off and do the kind of photographs they wanted to do, mm. you know, cover wars or cover big events, which were much more difficult to to cover as a freelance. Yeah, I don't think it's changed. I think there's still the same mentality and attitude. I'm sure. Oh, sure. But I don't know where people are selling photographs anymore. There aren't that many newspapers and magazines, are there? Yes, I think the outlet for work on spec and your own personal projects is very limited. I think with the age of digital publishing, it's given photographers an excuse now to be able to fund their own projects and fund their own books. And, and myself included a, a lot of photographers who make money day to day to fund their own work. So this was the period you were also shooting a lot of your street fashion. And then you got this urge to go to Algeria. Why? Well, that was early. That was much earlier. That was in 1958. I had got married about a, a year yeah. before, and uh, I was living in Paris. It was the time of the Algerian War of Independence. They wanted their, it, you know, Algeria had been a colony of France, and they wanted independence. And it was very, very difficult, horrible battle. And the French were bombing villages. People were being strafed in their little villages. And a lot of people moved from, refugees moved from their villages in Algeria to Tunisia, where there were hospitals to take care of them and refugee camps. And in their wisdom, the French bombed a hospital on the border, which created a very big international incident. Nobody was talking about the refugees. Now, I had been aware of refugees from the time I was a child because of World War II. There were always refugees coming to the door, selling things, trying to earn a living. And so I knew about this mass movement of people and always felt very sad about it and wanted to do something. Nobody was talking about the Algerian refugees, and I was based in Paris, and I thought I would like to go and take some photographs. So I did go, and I was able to make contact with the Liberation Army and was taken from Algiers to across the border to Tunisia, where I photographed refugees. When I got back to Paris, I took the photographs to Cartier-Bresson, and he sent them to the Observer, and the Observer published them. And I was very proud for two reasons. One, because somebody was speaking about these poor people, and the Observer did later send a journalist down to investigate the situation. But also, it was my very first front page. I'm, to this day, very proud of that. There's a lovely picture of the family just in the gateway of the tent. There was like a stonewall gateway in the tent in the sort of middle of the shop. The, fa the mother and the kids are looking at you. It's wonderful. Yes. Shop. I absolutely love it. Yes. 
the one photograph that I really like is, is the one just of the mother sitting there holding the baby. And it was a rather moving one for me because I was at the time six months pregnant. I could put myself in the situation of this poor woman. Whatever happened to that baby? It's interesting you say that. I often look at pictures like that. In fact, I was looking at your Paris street models and I was just thinking, what happened to that model? What happened to the man in the rain back standing, staring at you, taking a picture? Yes. <laughs> what did he go and say to his wife when he yeah. got home? How did he come here? That? <laughs> oh, he probably so didn't it's, say it's, a word. It's not. It's interesting, isn't it? Because that'll be somebody's father. You just ah, oh, just it, that whole concept. What you just said there is just intriguing. What what happened to that man in the street? Maybe that's your next book. <laughs> what happened to the people in the pictures? Yeah, it's interesting. I love it when photographers do that. Daniel Meadows, who I was talking to recently, he went out on a bus and he photographed people and portraits from his bus. And then 30 years later, somebody, he found them all. He did an exhibition with the individuals with the picture. Really? That sounds fascinating. Yeah, oh, it's, it's amazing. And I love that process. And, and that's what intrigues me about things like that. You know, it's, we, we all feel the same. When you look at your, a lot of your portraits, you sort of know what happened to these people because they're in Wikipedia now. <laughs> um, you know, because you photographed a lot of famous people and, and we sort of get that. But just the normal run-of-the-mill person like myself being in a shop, it's really interesting. You must have looked quite odd in Tunis ago, this female photographer, because you would have just a sight nobody really was used to seeing, I guess. Well, especially yeah. with the Roliflex. Because you had to almost be on yeah. top of the picture. You know, you couldn't be on the other side of the road where <laughs> nobody saw you. You were getting this urge to create documentary. You were doing a lot of portraits as well. You met some writers as well, Calvino. Yes. Well, I have to go back in time because a lot of this was through a very interesting Indian writer who I had met when I first went over to England in my very first trip over to uh, France, his name is Mulk Raj Anand, and he's now dead, uh, but he was one of India's leading writers in English at a time when very few Indian writers were writing in English. I met him on the crossing from, I think it was... France to England, uh, my very first trip, he came and sat down next to me on the ferry boat and just butt into the conversation I was having with somebody. We got to talking. I asked him what he did, and he said he was a writer. And so I said, well, look, I have a list of books I have to buy in England for some friends in New York because they're uh, under copyright to Penguin and you can't buy them in the States. Could you please tell me where I might be able to find them? So he looked at the list of books and he says, well, they're all mine. <laughs> how, how's that for serendipity? How's that possible that you met this guy on a ferry? Really, I think this kind of strange serendipity runs through my life. So we became fast friends until he died at the age of 95. It was he who suggested that I do this picture story on Indira Gandhi. That was my first trip to India. And it was he who also introduced me to Cartier-Bresson because he had met Cartier in India when Cartier was right. visiting there. So, you know, everything ran in little circles. And you've had a knack of meeting people. Yes, people pop in and out. Here we are. But you've met these really interesting individuals who were quite iconic to either music, fashion or film. And it's really interesting. Oh, science as well. Let's not forget Einstein. Yeah, but, you know, you've met a lot of influential people in your life from both sides of the camera. It's just an amazing knack when you do reflect back on your life. I'm, I'm quite intrigued by 
that sort of passageway. You've met a lot of historical individuals. Well, I'm sure you did too. We do as photographers. I have met Cartier Bresson briefly, but I didn't hang out with him or Kappa. Wish I had. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into the 60s. You were a single mum. You were picking up work with the Observer. What was it like? Yes, I was a single mum and I came to England in the swinging 60s. And I was not involved in the swinging scene. <laughs> I was just eager to earn a living and take care of my daughter. Eventually, I was able to pick up work through the help of very kind, generous people. I don't know uh, if you knew M Michael Pito, the photographer. He was a Hungarian photographer, and he worked for The Observer. Oh, of course, yeah, Pito, yeah. I was introduced to him through Mulkrash Anand. He was very generous, introduced me to The Observer. I was able to take over some of the work he was doing on BBC programs, acting in the 60s, things like that, little, you know, jobs, until I found my feet, again, through the generosity of others, Somebody came through from New York, I remember, his way to Lebanon. And I had met him through a photo agent that I knew in New York. I gave him, you know, contacts to see in Beirut. And he said, would you be interested in working for a very big American newspaper? And introduced me to them. They became sort of the people that I worked for constantly, even without a contract. And so that opened doors to other newspapers and magazines. And I was able to manage to survive. Let's put it that way. Well, you're photographing some interesting people. You had a really good, solid apprenticeship, and now you started to sort of take pictures independently. I think, I think one is always learning. Yeah, absolutely. You know. As I say, I stopped learning because of the uh, business of digital. I decided <laughs> I've had enough. Don't want to learn any more technology. Just going back to Michael Pito, um, which is yes. P-E-T-O, he, he was yes. also very influential with David Hearn's career and life as well. Very. Yes, yes. He was lovely to young photographers. He really helped as much as he could. Yeah. What was next then? You came out of the 60s, you went into the early 70s where you, you documented Indira Gandhi. Yes. What was going on in the 70s and 80s for you? Your daughter would be much older, you would be more independent. Did you marry again? I did, actually. But some years later, after I'd retired, my husband died, so I am no longer married. <laughs> I suppose they say women outlive the men. <laughs> You frequented Vidi India a lot in the 70s and 80s. What were you doing at in India? What was your next role in life? Well, the India pictures were to do a picture story called A Day in the Life of Indira Gandhi. Yes. So that was arranged. And, of course, history came in there because while I was driving from Bombay to Delhi to meet her, she declared war on Pakistan and had actually sent me a message in Bombay through the Secret Service that she wanted me not to meet her in Delhi, but someplace else. And I'm afraid you'll have to look this up, where it was she gave the speech declaring war on Pakistan. But she wanted me to meet her there. And because Mulkraj Anand and I were driving from Bombay to Delhi, and he had arranged all of our accommodation all along the way. He said, don't meet her wherever this place was. Tell her we'll meet in Delhi, which is what I did. And, of course, missed a scoop because she declared war. And, of course, you can say, scoop Stafford, I am not. <laughs> Just going back to some of the portraits and going back to our little discussion previously where I said you've met so many interesting people in history and you've got pictures of Sharon Tate as well. Well, those photographs were assignments from newspapers I was working yeah. for. Of course. What was Sharon Tate like? Very beautiful. She was. And didn't deserve what she got. 
You were lucky to meet Joanna Lumley so young as well. Wow. Well, Joanna Lumley was divine. I still consider her one of my divinities. She is beautiful, intelligent, a great humanitarian. I can't speak highly enough of her. And I photographed her for an American fashion newspaper who were doing a story on Jean Muir, who was a very fine British fashion designer. She was, at the time, modeling for Jean Muir. And that's how I happened to photograph her. I bumped into her a few times in Sainsbury's, actually. (laughs) Oh, she's terrific. The 60s was an amazing period for photographers. Were you part of that scene? Because you were photographing the likes of Twiggy and Sharon Tate. No, I just was not the part of any scene. Really? I was worried about earning a living and taking care of my child. And I didn't like the 60s scene, especially from a woman's point of view. Right. I found the men absolutely appalling. They wouldn't even invite you out for a cup of coffee if... It, there wasn't a guarantee of a night together. Wow. And I thought this lack of sophistication and vulgarity yeah. was appalling. So I, I just kept myself clear. My friends were, were people who were not part of the 60s scene. It must have been very tricky being a female photographer in that period. You don't think of these things, Zach. You know that. You just do your job. Absolutely. I love some of your Indira Gandhi images about which are in colour. That's an interesting shift for you, the mix of colour and black and white. Well, I met Indira Gandhi on the plane following the war with Pakistan and was able to get those photographs. And then I followed her around Uh, because she, after the war, was talking to the army and going in to visit soldiers who had been injured. And one of my favorite photographs is the one of her giving a rose to a wounded soldier. I like that one. That is a beautiful shot, by the way. That's the, with the window light, silhouetting the rose. Yes, yes. I never use flash, you see. Yeah. I don't know how to use flash. (laughs) One of my favourite shots in that set is the simple shot, but I'm just going to look at it now, actually. It's the shot of her dressing the people in the park, but it's in colour. Oh, yes. It's beautiful, the colour. And that's what I'm saying. Why did you see colour in that as well? Well, you know, as a photographer yourself, um, there was a point when the newspapers only published in black and white. And so most of the early stuff was black and white. And it was only later that I started shooting in colour. So I kind of alternated when I was with her, um, colour and black and white. But I think most of the photographs that I did with her outdoors were in colour because, again, I didn't know how to use the flash. (laughs) (laughs) And so where I could, I used natural daylight. Yeah, and I think it took a long time before colour well, actually, it would have been colour transparency then, wouldn't it? And colour neg yes. really sort of yes. come into its own in about the early 90s, didn't it? Where you, you didn't really need flash to use. Where, you, where it was much more forgiving in light negative later on and shooting the colour. Well, outdoors, I, could, I did shoot um, a lot of colour of Indira Gandhi at home. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the whole series of A Day in the Life of Indira Gandhi was shot in colour. Yeah, I'm looking at it. There, yeah, I've seen it. What, what were you shooting it with? What colour film? Kodachrome, I think. Koda or Ektachrome. Yeah. Can't remember. There's a lovely sort of colour to it. It's beautiful. Where did you say you met her? On an aeroplane? Yes. Um, it was after Christmas. She was going, following the war, to talk to the army and to people at rallies all over the country. And so I went up to Kashmir with her, which is not too bad a a name dropper, is it, to say, well, I went to Kashmir with Indira Gandhi. You have an amazing knack of just bumping into people. Yes. (laughs) At any rate, we went to Kashmir 
and she did all of these speeches. Some of them are in my book, and I love the ones with all the ladies sitting like little babushka dolls listening to her speak. Yeah, it's amazing. And you know what? I'm I'm really happy that we bumped into each other. Just being a pleasure listening to some of your stories. We'll continue this one day. And I, I'm just fascinated with your journey. It's quite extraordinary, your life and the people you've met. And your photographs really intrigued me from the very beginning. Well, I'm, I'm pleased you say that. Thank you very much. Coming from you, I'm really delighted. Well, thank you. It's been a total pleasure. Thank you for taking the time and thank you for putting up with our little tech issues we had earlier on. Well, thank you for putting up with our tech issues. No, it's been a pleasure. We got there and I've really enjoyed this last hour. We'll keep in touch. You're going to have one hell of a time putting all of this together. It's a labour of love and, that, and that's why I'm doing it. Well, thank you. Marilyn, it's been a pleasure. I wish you well. I will catch up with you very soon. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Goodbye to you. We are floored. We are bound down. See us. Careless cold. See us. Steel dawn. We are stone. We are stone. See us born, see us wind down, see us fly low to our blind.